And we are live. What's up? This is Mike Wall and welcome to the Agent Revolution podcast where we deconstruct some of the biggest challenges facing today's real estate agent. Today, I'm joined by my man, Dan Puzz, agent, mega agent from Reno, Nevada. And uh, Dan and I are going to talk about overcoming your fear of prospecting. So let's dig right in, brother. How are you? Doing good, man. Thanks. Good to see you uh, after that Cincinnati mastermind. That was awesome. Yeah. And and were you, I think you were on the call just a minute ago too for listing class. Were you on that yeah. call? Yeah, I was on that call, man. That is gold. I love all of that stuff. So much information. Dude, Reese is in woods, man. That is fire, man. My uh, my uh, my gears are churning right now, man. I, I, I'm uh, it, it's it's actually hard to do this right now. It's like I, I mean, I'm really excited because I, I like today's topic, but my gears are just churning, man. I'm chomping at the bit to get started. But I guess granted, we are we're producing content right now. So let's dig right in, brother. Hey, before we get started, man, tell Tell the audience a little bit about you, your background. Yeah, so I had no aspirations to ever be in real estate or sales or anything like that in my entire life. And uh, what started all off is I ended up getting fired from a job for $9 an hour at the golf course, right? And I was collecting- You never do things the easy way, man, do you? Never, never. Not one time in my life do I get, get it the easy way. But um, I've been blessed in several ways. And here's one of them. I got fired from this job for $9 an hour at the golf course, collecting golf balls. Probably a few weeks later, um, my girlfriend at the time puts this book in front of me, the 10 X rule by Grant Cardone. And I'd never thought about sales or anything totally changed my perspective hundred percent about life and people and, and the way people make money, scarcity and all that. So what I ended up doing is figuring out a way which was, I thought, either real estate or lending or anything that was 100% commission. I'm like, all right, if I'm going to make some money, it's going to be all up to me, 100% in life. I'm going to have to do something like that. I decided on real estate. Mm -hmm. So that was basically how I decided that. About a month later, I ended up moving to Reno, Nevada. So it was just chance that I left San Jose, California, ended up in Reno, Nevada. I was working at a buffet as an assistant supervisor, chasing kids around, stopping people from stealing crab legs and you know, making sure that not too much soft serve ice creams going out the door. Pretty much the worst job you can imagine yourself doing at 33 years old. You just know you're not living up to your potential. You just yeah. know, it. I mean, it, it just hurt going into that job every single day. So in the meantime, I'm getting my real estate license. I'm hiding in the back of the buffet, doing my my real estate license exam online, basically trying to do it on my phone. Got through all the coursework, got my real estate license. Then the real work began. I thought once you got your real estate license, it's like, all right, I'm going to make money. No, not not like that at all. Um, show up to real estate and, you know, day number one, I'm like, all right, what do I do? And they're like, well, uh, go knock some doors. And I'm like, knock doors? What are you talking about, knock doors? I'm like, I, go you knock on people's doors and ask them for business? They're like, yeah, yeah, that's 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 what you do. So uh, I'm like, well, it's either I stay at this shit buffet and clean up seafood mess on the floor and chase children around for the rest of my life, or I'm going to go knock some doors. Mm -hmm. Now, look, nobody in Reno at that time that I know of anyway, nobody had been successful out there knocking doors. There was no mega agents at that time. In my office, the highest producer at that time was um, – was about 7 million in sales for the year, uh, about 35 to 40 transactions. And it was probably 50% referral and 50% REO business. Wow. And that was the highest producer. So when I was asking people questions about, Hey, how, how do I get new leads and how do I knock doors? And no, people looked at me like I was fucking crazy. They're like, you're going to go knock doors in Reno. I had people tell me, don't do it. They're like, man, you're going to get shot out here. You know, Reno's a little rural, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of the Wild West. You got old cowboys out here, you know, a lot of neighborhoods too, but they're like, oh, that's not going to work. You need to do open houses. You need to do this. And I'm like, well, open houses are only for the weekends. I didn't know any better. So what I did is I just started knocking on doors. I just didn't listen to anybody. Went out knocking on doors every single day, every free minute I had. I was either working at the buffet, sleeping in my car, waiting to go to the buffet, or I was out knocking doors. And I did that for about a full year until I had enough deals under my belt that I said, screw this, I'm gonna try making cold calls on the phone. And that's when I was able to get on the phone and I was able to afford the Mojo dialer and afford a desk and afford to 
pay for all the programs that I could, you know, a database, top producer and all that. And then I made a transition from knocking doors into telephone sales. So it took me about a full year, about, about, yeah, about a full year to make a transition from working two jobs at the Atlantis buffet to being able to get out of that into real estate full time. So it was, it was a grind. It was a hustle. And uh, like you said, I, I didn't do anything the easy way. That's for sure. Yeah, dude, that's a great story, man. I, I always, everybody's got a story, you know what I mean? And I, that's why I always love to show, start to show off that way because everybody's got like their own unique story. And typically it involves like hitting rock bottom and then, and then figuring out that, you know, you don't want to do that for the rest of your life. And then, you know, and then the sky's the limit. That's the great thing about our industry is there really is no ceiling. And so you you are truly rewarded for what you're willing to put in or not rewarded for what you're not willing to put in. And so, you know, obviously you figured out early on that um, you, there was a problem that you could solve. Other, you could see what other people were doing in your marketplace and what worked for them. And then you could also see that there was a void to fill, right? There was nobody out knocking doors, man. So that was naturally something that you know, that you could go do to start generating business or conversations right away. And then you learned that I can't scale a business like that, right? I can only knock so many doors every day. And then you learn, well, hell, why don't I, I'll get a triple line dialer and I can call 300 people an hour versus, you know, I can knock, I, I don't know, I can knock 15 doors in an hour, right? And so you hit the phones and then what happened when you started hitting the phones, man? So a couple of things happened. Uh, one of the great things that happened is right away, I got immediate business because I heard from a program that I should call these expired listings. And I didn't even know what they were at the time. And I didn't really know about calling FISBOs either. But the great thing, and I guess it was just perfect timing, is nobody else in Reno was actually making calls either. So nobody was hitting the phones. And so I'd get into the office and call these expireds and just by default. I didn't know what to say. I just got some scripts online that I found and I just started making these calls, but nobody else was doing it. So by default, I got lucky and guess what happened? Started getting some listings, okay? I mean, they were terrible. My listing presentation was eight pieces of printer paper that I wrote some things on Microsoft Word and red print and would bring it to a listing, but nobody else was calling. Nobody else was showing up to these listing appointments. So guess what? I got some listings, a little bit tougher these days, but at the time it started working. But there was also another big lag, and that was the circle prospecting part of it. So I'd get a couple listings from expireds and FISBOs, yeah. and then I'd call neighborhoods just cold, cold, cold calls to, to nobody where I knew I was calling, wrong name, wrong person, you know, bad data for Mojo. But what eventually happened is I realized that those were nurtures, meaning it was going to take three months, six months, 12 months for those cold, cold, cold leads to start to convert into business. And I was terrible at it. I mean, I didn't follow up. I did all the typical mistakes. So much money went out the window because I didn't have systems in place. I, I got really good at getting those immediate appointments and getting business, but I was terrible at the follow-up game. And so it took another year for me to figure out, because I'm a slow learner, how to follow up and how to put these people into a program and how to make these calls and keep in touch and give them, you know, give them the love so that when they're ready, nine months, 12 months, 18 months out that they were actually coming back to me at that point. So um, it was it was a steep learning process because nobody was doing it. So the only training I had on what was actually working was really working was watching videos of people do it online. And that that's all I had. If there was some old YouTube videos, there was a few people like Derek Lipsky who I'd see videos of his old shit online. And it was, yeah, and it helped me because there wasn't any, there was no content, there was no material. And I didn't know where else to find it. All I knew was, well, these successful people were doing it. That's what I'm going to do. I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm not going back to that buffet. There was nothing that was going to take me back to cleaning up crab legs and chasing kids around. Yeah, it's so good, man. That's such good stuff. So what, what I immediately think of, right, is that – and the whole point of this call is like we know that the average agent uh, out there in into the marketplace right now, they understand – from a tactical standpoint that they should make phone calls, right? And, and in most cases, they even have the data. If they have access to the MLS, they know which listings are expiring. If they have access to Zillow or for sellbyowner.com, they have access to the for sale by owners, right? And, and what we, and so we know that, but 
my question to you is, so if they know where to get the data and they know what to do, why don't they do it? Yeah, I'll tell you right now, and this is just my perspective. It's fucking scary. That's why. And it's you got nerves going before you make these calls. You know what you're supposed to do. But unless somebody's sitting over your shoulder, which if you're a single agent like I was, nobody was telling me that I had to do it. I'll just say this. For me, I knew that I had to make those calls because the alternative was so bad. Yeah. I just couldn't face going the rest of my life working at a buffet as an assistant supervisor. I was like, OK, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Okay. Look, I wasn't in the sun digging ditches, you know, for the rest of my life. I was in a nice air conditioned office. All I had to do was make these calls. It doesn't seem that bad, but the fear that we have about making cold calls and bothering people and, you know, being told to screw off and, you know, all the fear that comes with prospecting, people just aren't willing to do that work. And without the right coaching in place and, you know, someone who is showing success. And that's the hard part is, is if there's nobody around you that is showing success doing it, it's really hard to pick up that phone. And I'll tell you right now, I had days, several of them, where I would get in my car to go door knock a neighborhood and I couldn't get out of the truck. Couldn't do it. I would sit there for 30 minutes, 45 minutes on Facebook, looking at my telephone, thinking of any reason not to get out of my car because I was so nervous to go knock doors because it sucked. Now, as soon as you get it five doors down, you're like, okay, no problem. I'm, yeah. I'm in the game. Let's let's get this done. Same with phone calls. I had days where I'd sit in my office and I mind you, I don't know anybody in the office. There was nobody making cold calls. Nobody had ever been successful making cold calls in my office. I'm the only person that I know of. If I needed advice, I'd have to call to another agent in a different state and say, how are you doing this? Everyone would walk by my office, look in my window and laugh and be like, hey, Dan, are you still making those calls? And I'm like, yep. And they're like, hey, how many deals have you got? I'm like, well, I got a listing. They're like, oh, that's good. Keep it up. You know, laughing at you at the same time. They're like a little envious, like, hey, maybe I should be doing that. But there's no real success. So just making the calls, man, it's nerve wracking. And if you don't know anyone who's showing signs of success from it and you don't have anybody pushing you to do it. I mean, it's going to be really hard to get on the phone because of the nerves and the fright. And, you know, our society sets people up to tell people from a very early age, starting as soon as you're a kid, hey, don't bother people. Be quiet. Don't be pushy. Don't be a salesman. And so getting over all that fear really set me back. And, you know, I'll be honest right now. I still get a little bit of nerves when I got to make that first phone call of the day. Sometimes even now I've been doing this. I've I've sold hundreds of listings. I've shown, you know, a lot of success in the industry from from making calls. I still get a little nerves. It never goes away 100 percent. And that's one of the things I've just come to terms with is, hey, you know, when you make that phone call, you're on stage. I mean, you are on the spotlight. And if people in your office are listening to you, you know, they're listening to you. You want to be successful. You don't want to be shown up to be a jerk. And you kind of you know, sometimes end up, you know, getting told some bad words on the phone call and you feel all bad about it, but you just move on, you know, I mean, just move on to the next call. So hopefully that answers that question, why people don't do it. They know they should, but you know, our society's conditioned people to just not be that bothersome salesperson. And it puts a, it stops a lot of people from being successful in this industry. Yeah. Yeah, dude, no doubt. And and so the big difference, and we may have already given away the best nugget uh, at the beginning of the show here in that, So the big difference I see with you and with me, because I was in a job where I felt like, you know, I, I, I was not passionate about it. I, I, I I did not want to do it long term and, and I was miserable, absolutely miserable. I was even making really good money and I was just miserable. So maybe the difference that I'm seeing um, is that we were, and maybe other successful agents who have grinded on the phones and, 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 and kind of played that game, they got to a place to where they, they could no longer go on that way. And so maybe, so maybe the, and maybe we are the exception to the rule, maybe that when most agents get into this, this industry, maybe they have not hit that uh, proverbial rock bottom, right? They just kind of transition into the industry. Maybe they were doing something they kind of liked, Maybe, you know, they, they just haven't seen that ugly side of life. And so maybe that's the difference. So what do you recommend to the agent who has gotten into the industry? They understand what to do. 
but they ha- maybe maybe they haven't hit that proverbial rock bottom. How do they? Where do they find that fire, man? Where do they find the fire we found in order to to get up the confidence to get on the phones and start converting appointments? Yeah, look, um, I can tell you the biggest thing that I was missing from from day one when I started in real estate was environment and get into an environment of other sharks, other people who are out there doing what you want to do. I'll tell you this, though. You have to have that desire because this it's not necessarily easy. I'm, well, look, it's very simple. You, you come into the office, you sit down, you get on a phone. Simple, right? It's not easy. Um, it's hard to do it day in and day out. It gets monotonous. It's boring. You've got to have something, a vision of where you're going and something that you have to achieve no matter what. For me, I was making a decision every day when I started whether or not I was going to eat that day, lunch, or if I was going to put $10 of gas in my car so I could drive to a neighborhood to go knock doors. And that was the decision that I had to make. And for me, it was very simple. I was like, I'm doing this, or the alternative is I'm going back to the Atlantis. And I was not going back to that buffet. So I was in a position where I had to do it or the alternative was, was miserable. Now, if you're not in that position, And let's just say your spouse makes a lot of money and you're just getting into real estate. It may be a little bit tougher unless you've got that chip on your shoulder, unless you've got this outcome that you have to achieve and nobody is going to stop you from getting it. Then you're going to be ready. You get that environment going of other sharks who are doing what you want to do that are going to push you and, and, you know, people who are not walking by your office laughing at you in your window for making cold calls telling you it doesn't work. Okay. Get in that environment of people who are telling you, Hey, awesome call. Didn't go the way expected. Make the next call. Get in that environment of people showing success, doing what you want to do. They're out there. You just got to find them. That may mean you have to change brokerages. That may mean you have to get on the team of people who are doing what you want to do. Make sure that you've got a bigger why you got that chip on your shoulder and then get the training. And, and start training with people day in and day out. I mean, you got to become a nut about getting on the phone. I would consume so much material and so many videos and so many scripts. And I was doing, um, I was doing live calls with other agents, just role playing across the country. I'd get into groups of people who were being successful and, um, NAEA, when I hooked up with Jeff Keani, I mean, he brought my game that was already decent to another level, you know, it was getting, Getting in that environment of sharks and getting the training and then having that chip on my shoulder of I have to be successful no matter what. Now you've got something. Now now you're ready to go out there and win. If you don't have one of those ingredients, I'm not so sure. I see a lot of people come in and out of this industry and I see who the people are that are successful and they have that or they're willing to have that. They're willing to be coached. They're, they're willing to take direction. They don't have an ego. And if they do have an ego, they're ready to set it aside so that they can get to the next level. And you're going to have to do it. Your ego is going to get smashed. Your ego is absolutely going to get smashed in this industry. People who you know tell you they're going to list their home with you are going to turn around and list with somebody else. And it's going to happen to you so many times. People you've been following up with for two years, putting in the work day in and day out, they are going to list with somebody else. And it's going to happen to you over and over again. You got to be able to put your ego aside, not worry about somebody swearing at you on the phone. You've got to have a really short memory of each phone call that went wrong and just be like, okay, that was a bad phone call. Move on to the next. Then you'll be ready to get on that phone and start smashing it. Yeah. And something I heard you say that that I think is really important also is um, you got to be able to tap into your why. You know what I mean? Like, I think that is, I don't want to gloss over that because I think at its core, that is probably the most important thing. Like your, you were able to tap into your why was really that you could not, you could not see a life for yourself where you were working at the Atlantis buffet, right? That was, you knew you had made a commitment that you could never, ever go back and do that again. And you, if you ever, if you ever caught yourself slipping, you could immediately go back to that memory and boom, man, you were back on track, right? And so for that agent out there who doesn't have that Atlantis, that that Atlantis moment to be able to tap into, maybe for them it's their, maybe for them it's their family. Maybe for them it's it's their um, you know, it's their job at some shoe store that they had. It, it, it could be whatever, 
but you've got to be able to tap into that emotion. It's that emotion that creates motion, right? And so if you can tap into that emotion, that will ultimately drive you. That's where your why, your quote unquote why, right? That's where that, that's where that resides at. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And look, it, it goes back to getting fired from that golf course at, you know, 32 years old. You just know at that moment when you're working for nine bucks an hour, getting fired from a golf course, you know, you're not reaching your potential and you can either do something about it or you can continue down the victim mentality pathway of, oh, I shouldn't have been fired and, you know, screw those guys and I'll just get another whatever. OK, I chose to do something about it. I knew I wasn't reaching my potential. I knew it wasn't going to be easy. And I didn't know what I was going to do at that point. I had no idea. And luckily, that book got put in front of me, the 10X rule. And I'm like, OK, I'm going to go into sales because that is unlimited. There's no cap. There's nobody telling me how many hours I can work, how much money I can make, what I need to sell. That's the direction I'm going to go. Just happen to land into real estate. Yeah. I'm curious, Dan, do you have like an ideal day kind of like set up for like the best times to call or maybe a specific, um, maybe a specific plan that you would go through before, you know, you actually got on the phones each day? Oh, uh, Mike, you know, I do brother. All right. So my day is very, very structured. All right. I'm very, very regimented in the very beginning of the day. And from, from 4.30 in the morning until noon, I know what, exactly what I'm doing every single minute. From noon until I quit, usually about 7, 8 o'clock, is for putting out fires and chaos appointments. Okay, so we'll run through it really quick. I get up every day at 4.30. I'm in the gym by 5. I get into the office by 7.30. By 8 o'clock, I've already taken a look at all the information I need to know for who I'm going to call, have my list set up. I'm calling expireds and for sale by owners. First thing in the morning, I want to be the first person to dial them, eight o'clock to nine o'clock. Now, in my market, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of for sale by owners or expireds. I'm lucky to get one or two a day, okay? Yeah. One or two, and who knows how many of those are actual opportunities. So I make sure to call those first, and then I go through the old expireds for the continuation of that hour. Yeah. From about 10 o'clock, uh, from nine o'clock to 11 o'clock, Circle prospecting, just listed, just sold phone calls, putting new people into the database. Those are the people that we're trying to build some relationships with, trying to get to them before they get to Zillow, trying to be that person of value before they start going online to see what their home is worth and start contacting agents, one of those three little pretty faces on the sidebar of Zillow, try to get to them first to be their point of contact, send them the information because they're thinking about buying or selling a home within you know the next year. From 11 o'clock to noon, I'm doing follow-up. After that, I have my afternoon open. I'm open for meetings. I'm open for these phone calls. I'm open to coach. I'm open for whatever problems I need to put up with. Now, here's the thing. I'm going on appointments, meet with home sellers, whatever sort of consultations I need to have. If I don't have an appointment, back on the phones for the rest of the day, no questions asked. So if I don't have something, I'm either working on something I need to do, which is, you know, working on hiring, I'm working on a consultation, whatever, back on the phone for the rest of the day. And so punishment of not having an appointment, having white space on my calendar, punishment, get back on that phone, start grinding out until you get an appointment, bottom line. I love it, I love it, I love it, man. So for the for the folks, for the agents, uh, brokers who tuned into this, um, who, who maybe who who know and, and let's face it, I mean most 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 everybody knows on some level that when you pick up the phone, it's a good thing, right? Or not a lot. There's a there's stuff that can go wrong, but for the most part, you're doing you're you're having you're doing the right activity to generate income for your business. So to that individual um, who who maybe tuned into this and they're thinking, all right, you know. I'm going to I'm going to pick up the phone tomorrow and I'm going to start making phone calls. What what is just one really good piece of advice you would give to that individual as they go into the office first thing in the morning? Start immediately. I mean just just get on the phone and make that first phone call. Don't check your emails. Don't go get coffee. Don't start talking to people in the office. Get up get the headset on, get your list and start calling first thing. Start get just get into the routine. Put your cell phone away. Don't check the notifications on Facebook because it's just a distraction. You'll start talking yourself out of it. So we don't do our meetings first thing in the morning. A lot of teams do. I don't. 
I like to just get everybody into the office. We get in at the same time. We start, we're, we're calling the same expireds first thing in the morning. Yeah. I, I mean, so one of, one of my guys will call an expired. He won't get the appointment. I'll call that same expired, get the appointment. And he'll be like, man, how'd you do that? And I'll be like, well, you know, I just talked to him in a certain way. Here's what I said. I'll do the same thing. I'll get, I'll get shut out on one person. He'll call the same expired. My guy, Tucker, he'll get the appointment from the same person. I'll look over and be like, man, how'd you get that appointment? You know, just have different people calling. We get the phone calls out of the way. We do our team meetings usually right about noon, right? When the slow part of the day for any phone calls happens. So everybody takes their wins for the day. Here's where we're having trouble on the phone. Here's what we're doing for the rest of the afternoon. The rest of the day is good. I say you just got to get into the get in the marketplace get into your office, whatever you're doing, and just start making those calls and, and make it a routine that no matter what, these are your no matter what, so you're gonna get into the office and you're gonna pump up that first dial. You're just gonna put the headset on and get started. And most people don't get started ever. They've got all these ideas, Who's here's who I'm gonna call today, this is what I'm gonna do, everything except putting on the headset and making the first dial. Yeah, love it, man. That is, that is, that is a pearl. I hope you all wrote that one down. You know, one thing I've, I've been curious about with you is, um, you know, you had all this success kind of quickly, I think, um, from most people's standards. And, and you know, you're, I think you rose to be like the top agent in your office by like 2016, right? I think you were, I think you were voted the number one uh, agent in your office 2016 from a production standpoint, weren't you at Keller Williams? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I'm curious, man, because you had all this success, you had all this stuff going for you. Why the move to EXP? Um, yeah, honestly, I can make it as simple as this. Um, the office, the market center that I was in um, screwed up. Basically, they um, we had a big dispute on um, an ethical problem that arose in the office. And it gave it opened the door at that time for me to start looking at other brokerages. And when I looked at the models of what was happening around the area, I saw EXP at the time as the opportunity that for one uh, KW wasn't offering and the structure just happened to work. And that was the profit share and the stocks and all that looked really good. And and I'll be 100 percent honest, the people who I was most I was coaching with, looking up to in the industry for advice. John Kitchens, Jay Kinder, Michael Reese, they were all pushing at that time. It just made sense. I was in with Jeff Keani already coaching with him at the time for telephone calls, ISA programs. I'd been to their boot camps before they were with EXP and they made the move. And it was just the perfect storm at the time. Little, little uh, mishap at, at my current brokerage where I was at. And it was like, all right, well, you know what? This model, it looks like it works. These people trust the model. I started looking into the numbers and I like the program. So we made the jump because there was the opportunity to make the jump. I'm not sure I would have made the jump as quickly as I would have had yeah. I not had the problem at the, at the brokerage I was at. Awesome, man. So, you know, we'll wrap this up, but if there are agents out there who are, or brokers who, who want to learn more about, you know, uh, building a successful business through prospecting, or um, they just have questions about growing a business, or even questions about joining EXP. Uh, how do they contact you, Dan? Yeah, they contact me. My email, uh, Reno, the city, Reno, and my last name, Puzz, RenoPuzz at gmail.com, R E N O P U Z at gmail.com. You can call me direct on my business line, 775 440. Seven zero seven eight. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. And you know what? That one actually might be worth another listen. I just love sharing these stories week after week because I know that agents like you, Dan, are helping change agents' financial lives, like literally, man. And so, you know, if you guys know somebody who might enjoy this podcast, please, please, please share it with them. If, uh, if you like this podcast, please go to wherever you Subscribe to podcast and subscribe. And um, I think that's it for this one. Would love to uh, would love to share my story with any of you all. If you guys want to go to meetmikewall.com, you can jump on my calendar, and I'd be happy to talk you through um, you know what we've done to build a team that sells over three hundred properties a year. And uh, we'll put a bow on this one, my brother. All right. Thanks for having me, Mike. All right, buddy. Thanks, Dan. 
Nice work, man. Yeah, it went off without a hitch, huh? <laughs>